We're back on the big show. It's Alex Belfield talking to my favourite people and the biggest stars in comedy, and Jeff Green is definitely one of them. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's good to talk to you. I'll tell you why, because you're a worker. There's no multi-million dollar contract for you, is there? Uh, there isn't, no, and, uh, and I'm starting to wonder why that hasn't happened. I resent that <laughs> in many ways. I love working and I love um, being busy. I um, if, I've, if I've got time off, I start to, um, you know, I try and put gigs in it. So I'll, so I'll be touring, and then I might not be doing a date between... Um, Derby, for example, and uh, Colchester. So I go, oh, maybe I could go and play the comedy store. <laughs> so I just feel I'm one of those people that just in, I enjoy performing, and it's uh, the alternative is to be staring at my wife and just wondering why we married each other. <laughs> but yes, it is that, it is, it's, and that's the great thing about stand-up comedy. It's so immediate, and you know you can write a joke in the morning and you can punt it out in uh, in, in the evening, and and you can get your get your result on it. I mean, I've written books and. The the, the for the process of, of getting a contract signed to writing to having it edited to having it proofread and then put out on the shelves is an inordinate length of time before you realise whether if it's any good. And sometimes I think a lot of people should be stopped. Some of the books <laughs> I've read, I'm going, no, no, it's no good. Um, you know, you're destroying trees. Um, so. And maybe they should try their books out as stand-up comedy before they commit them to uh, to newsprint. And I noticed this season everybody's releasing books, whether it's the celebrity you've never heard of or the 12-year-old celebrity or comedians who are trying to get into it. You were doing that, though, long before, weren't you? I mean, you've had many books out that have been successful. How do you feel about these people jumping on your bandwagon? Um, well, it's a big bandwagon. I... I, I, I I don't mind it. I, you know, it's it's the whole business is sink or swim. And the great thing about show business is it's um it's cyclical for a kickoff uh, in so much as you'll be flavor of the month and and then no one will want to know you i mean who no matter who you are jonathan ross could be flavor of the month uh, in the 80s in the 90s he's uh, you know he's queuing up for work same as john travolta you know it's uh, me so it's it, and, and 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 but in that respect also it comes round again and so you know one minute people think you're rubbish uh, you know like les dawson for example or benny hill the next thing people go these are national treasures and everything they did was was gold plated uh, fantastic and that's and that's what i love about it you know i always say to people because i've been in this business although i feel i always feel new but i've been in this business quite a long time and and i, I see new people and you know they get a little bit down i go mate it's going to come back it will just you know just bide your time so long as you're as long as you're funny and stick with what you're doing and don't jump onto other people's bandwagons so you know for example as a comedian you might go oh yeah well he's doing really well because he's doing jokes about dwarves and uh, <laughs> goblins <laughs> everyone's talking about goblins well I'm going to do some goblin material and uh, you know and I'll, but I'll add a weasel to it and they'll be and I'll be brilliant and then they go oh no no we're, we're all talking about the Iraq war now oh well I'll do some stuff about the Iraq you know you can't do that you know some of the greatest comics I've seen and the, the general public have, have embraced and loved ploughed their own furrow you know they decided that they were only going to do this one thing S names that spring to mind are Vic and Bob uh, for example like in the early 90s I remember them getting booed off on many occasions because they were bringing out odd shaped vegetables and doing <laughs> whole plays with these characters and, and there was um, Ian, Ian Pearson the talking crab and you know the people who had been brought up on you know, stand-up comedy, we just thought it was dreadful. Then the world came round to their you know, way of thinking. Same with Eddie Izzard. Um, same with Harry Hill. I mean, Harry Hill uh, would be a guy that, when, we're, when we were playing jonglers together, he, he would have to go on in the middle. Uh, you'd go, well, well, come on, Harry's great. You'll put him on at the end. No, 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 because he can go either way. You know, the audience may or may not take to him. Whereas now, he's the king of saturday evening television and everyone thinks he's always been a genius and he will always be a genius whereas there was times when people disputed that and where does that come from then is that about the exposure you get from tv and the fact that they know you and they know what they're going to get um well there's an element of that for the for the you know, for the great majority of people that don't really keep an eye on comedy but but generally it's, it is uh, cream rising to the top and you know people if you've got um, if you've got something unique to say and then you learn how to say it properly then um, you, you know you will find an audience and you will find there's very few geniuses that in comedy that you haven't heard of most of them become household names um, eventually there's there's not many Harry Hills lurking around still playing 
to 25 people. There just isn't. And with the Edinburgh Festival, everybody gets everybody gets the full glare of attention, at least for five minutes. With your show, though, I find it's a bit odd in the sense that you seem to have everybody. You've got young people, middle-aged people, couples, single guys. What well, the hell are they doing in my show? <laughs> I told the ushers to weed them out. I only want babes, hotties, and, uh, and yummy mummies. How have you managed to do it, though, to get all these different people interested? Because you're not really a swearer either. I don't hear incredible bad language or anything like that. There might be the odd expletive for, for effect. It might not come from the heart. I'm just pushing buttons. <laughs> I'm talking to a button pusher who's well. pushing my button. Yes, it is. A lot of it is for effect, and it is it less is more with with swearing. I do like swearing. I have to say, I have to wean myself off it. I mean, I was in um, Lancaster last night, and I, I loved it. It was a beautiful, august, two hundred year old theatre. Having said that, I was asking directions. No one knew where it was. I went. It's only been there two hundred years. And they still haven't got their head around it in Lancaster. So I'm, I'm now that's a joke, isn't it? I just noticed that that's an actual joke. Congratulations. No, no, it was. No, but I know it's true, but it's a joke, isn't it? How can people... A joke. There's three th- three elements to a stand-up comedy show. And, and how people say, how do you write your material? How do you get an hour of material? You go, right, OK. One is you sit down with a piece of paper and, and you go, right, I've got to write some jokes. And so you sort of um and are about some jokes. That's really difficult. But you've still got to try and get the, 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 uh, the structure down. And, and what do I want to talk about? Unless you're an improvising comedian, you know... Um, there aren't many of those but um, then the other element is walking uh, along the streets and you go oh that's funny you know, they, they, it's 200 years old and they've, they've da, da, da. Um, so you write that down and then the third is being on stage performing it and then and then and then it, and then ad libbing with the energy of the audience and then then it's starting to become a routine and then with over, over a few weeks people say how do you remember your material and you go well I've, I'm saying it over. I'm saying it over and over again. You know, uh, so I'll play it once in Lancaster. Then I'll, the other time I'll play it in in Colchester. Then then Derby. And I'm I'm I'm, I'm repeating myself. And once you've said something uh, in public out loud, it really does sink into your head, and it's generally not forgotten. And what about other stars? Would you rather work alone or on a bill where there are other comedians? Um, I love being on a bill. I used to love some of my early uh, days were driving back from student union, uh, four of us in the car, two of us have died. You know, hopefully there's, if, there's, if there's only two, not three, <laughs> then you can't enjoy it. If three have died and one hasn't, it's, it's a pretty quiet night on the way home. Or, but if, if one's died, you know, it's, yeah, but it's, there's usually a lot of banter and about talking about the, sh- the gig and all that. And driving home was fantastic. And then dropping people off and stopping at Watford Gap and meeting other comedians <laughs> who are on the way back from, you know, Birmingham University and stuff. So um, they were great. And they, were, and they were really learning times where you, you're on a massive learning curve about stand-up comedy. The, the, the weird thing about doing stand-up and getting successful is you, you tend to... Your success is ma- is measured by how few people there seem to be backstage. <laughs> Till in the end, it's just you, and and and, it's, and it is pretty dull. It can be very boring. Um, you know, you go on stage, you do your bit, and there's no warm up, and because they just come to you. And then the interval, people wonder what happens. Well, in the interval, you walk off stage, uh, and you sit and you have a glass of uh, coke or something like that. The, the key is not to have a beer because you haven't finished work yet. You've got another half to do. So you you might want a beer, but you have to keep the energy up uh, maybe look at your notes and see which jokes you've done and then how you're going to fit that all into and then it's and then just staring looking in the mirror <laughs> practicing your expressions and you then, make it sound all very depressing really and I can understand why some of them become quite dark do you follow that theory that all comedians are crying inside and they need the attention because they were bullied at school it is old fashioned I was never bullied uh, at school um I had a different. I had a, it was, I've, I had a different environment. I was. I was brought up in a very tense family. My parents had been married three times each, and there was a lot of angst. And we used comedy just to lighten the mood when there'd been a massive row, which was quite regular. Um, and then I suppose that's the same sort of thing. So, uh, but but this idea of every of this soul searching of there's been very there's been no suicides on the comedy circuit, <laughs> not f- not for decades. Um, generally, people are all right, and comedians, you know, we just take the Mickey. If if someone's a bit up themselves, they really don't last long because comedians won't put up with it. There's a few golden rules in comedy. One is don't be a pain in the ass. Two is don't practice your material on us. But, and and dress it up as banter, you know, because you will be found out. And if it's so embarrassing, if there's a whiff of, hang on, is this is this going in the set or you know, <laughs> the other is not taking what other people have said in banter and using it in your own act. They're, I suppose the three main rules of, mm. of backstage uh, at the comedy store. 
but um, it's yeah. There's not really people generally aren't 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 thinking of topping themselves. It's not Iceland. <laughs> and as for the people that you think are heroes and the people that inspired you to be here today, who are the people that you thought God they're clever? The people I brought up watching comedy. Uh, I'm from the era. My dad loved comedy. He loved laughing, and it was Dave Allen, and it was Dick, Dick Emery. Um, and then I suppose Jasper Carrot and Billy Connolly were the, were the stand-ups, the folky stand-ups. Mike Harding, uh, and then uh, Bob Newhart uh, on 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 record player, or, uh, and they were they were brilliant. The first stand-up comedy show I saw, which actually I sat agape, my jaw dropped and just stared. Once the TV was turned up till the white dot disappeared, was Richard Pryor in uh, 90, about 1983 the uh, Channel 4 had the amazing insight to to show uh, Richard Pryor live in concert which for me is the best stand up comedy uh, performance that you can buy and watch and they showed it about 2 o'clock in the morning in this racy Channel 4 and I watched it in a girlfriend's uh, flat in uh, Birmingham University in Halls of Residence and just cried with laughter at this bloke and I bought all his. Then I went out and bought all his um, his albums, and then I watched him, and, and that for me was like the the epiphany. But I, I didn't actually then go. I think I could go and do stand up comedy. It was only when I started watching Friday Night Live, Saturday Live, Ben Elton, the Young Ones, uh, uh, Fry and Laurie, and and um, Ed Edmondson and Rick Mail, all the, all them lot, and thinking, well, they just seem to be people like me, you know, graduates who who frequent the comedy store. So I went down to the comedy store in about 87. Uh, I was uh, working in um, in Guildford and I just got the train in and I went, this place exists. And I looked at it and there was a little note outside which said, if you're interested in, in um, trying out for the open spot. And I, as I read it, my blood chilled and I, I got all uh, nervous and uh, butterflies and the, the colour drained from my face. And I thought, I have no excuse. This is what I've got to do. I've got to go and do it. And had you got anything worth saying at that point? Oh, no. No, it's dreadful. I, I hope no one's got any... There's a recording of me on, in Derek Jameson's show, dying on my backside with terrible jokes. And I'd never... None of my jokes now could stay in my set. Some comedians have got jokes, which they... They're original jokes, which they put in their set. And, and comedians nowadays seem to, seem to have developed much quicker... You know, I'll see people who've been doing it a year and a half and they've got great material and it took me a, it took me much longer. Maybe there's more shows, but maybe people have learned how to do stand-up comedy now because it's been going for so long. And then you moved into publishing, which was a, a stroke of genius because it made you a lot of money and it made your name in a different way. Why did you think that the spoken word was as good as the written word and vice versa? <laughs> I'd like to say I had some, um, you know, amazing insight, but it wasn't. It was pure... I couldn't get a I couldn't get a DVD deal. This was two thousand and two. I had all this material. I said to my head, and they went, "Well, without getting a TV series, you're not going to get a DVD." And, I'm, and I went, "But that's how I communicate to my audience. I need to record something. I've got to give them something that they can hand to their friends, just like I did with Richard Pryor uh, discs and um, Bob Newhart and Chubby Brown bootleg tapes and all that. I need to get something out." And he went, "Write a book." And I went, well, well, the only thing I can do is put my jokes in alphabetical order. And he went, go on then. <laughs> so I did. I, and, I, and I, So I wrote the A to Z of Living Together. And um, and it's all my jokes. In, the jokes I was using in my set in alphabetical order. Sold a quarter of a million copies. Um, and then they gave me a DVD deal. And then and then they gave me two more books. There's so. nothing like belief in this business, <clears throat> is there? And, and, you know, believing in someone and giving them the deal just on the fact that you're great and talented. That's Well, I, that might happen. I've never I've never experienced it. I've never seen anybody else. It's all luck. It's all luck. And every and everyone is, everyone's sheep. I mean, there's the old is it William Goldman expression. Uh, nobody knows anything. And, you know, and that's <laughs> and that's true. You know, there's you know, there's this there's. there's uh, when, the, when they're doing recordings of TV shows now, it's at Mock the Week, QI, 8 out of 10 Cats, you know, the, the lying show. They've got five comedians in, in their head and they put them all on. So you've got Sean Locke, you've got Johnny Vegas, you've got um, uh, Mitchell, you've got Webb, you've got um, Jimmy Carr, you've got uh, Alan Davies, Bill Bailey. That's it. And then, OK, and then they'll, they'll, it's the same show, different... I'm saying this out of bitterness, of course, because my name was not that. Like <laughs> but it's the same show on different... Uh, but same show, different smell. And now I need to make you some money. CDs. Let's talk CDs yes, and making you money. Come, come on, help on. me with this. OK. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed <laughs> half of what I've said, 
much. And it's not been fu- it's not been funny, but it's um, <laughs> I, I've got a CD out. It's called Personal from A to Z, and it's um, some of my best routines from the past two or three years uh, recorded on CD uh, audio at the Lowry Theatre. Sellout audience thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I've even nipped out all the swearing, and uh, <laughs> you can play it to your granny. Uh, and it's I reckon it's a five star show. I think it's very, very good, and it's it's different. Bringing it out on CD is better than DVD because you can listen to it in the car. Yeah, Put yeah. It on your iPod. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you can probably you can either buy it from uh, Waterstones or uh, steal it from uh, from the internet. Um, <laughs> A bit torrented or something. I don't know <laughs> what happens these days, kids. I'd be perfectly happy to just to record stuff and stick it on the internet for nothing. That's what I would love to do. The fact is, you can't because, you know, there's other people. There's people uh, because that, to me, is the more people that co- watch my stuff, then they come to my shows and then they hear my new stuff and then uh, then you can have that. And then I don't see a problem with it. For me, I'm not precious about who has who has access to my material. And if I could stick it all out on YouTube, I would. Yeah, but then you're making life hard for yourself because then you've got to think of something else to say. But then that keeps me... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I still sometimes bring little bits back. People forget. <laughs> and, I, and then I go, oh, I haven't done that joke for quite a while. And it feels like, you know, it feels like one of those coats that you put up in the attic and you go, oh, even though the lapels are still quite they're massive and they go, oh, it's not quite right, but it's still, and it feels like a new coat. It always makes me smile because I think an old joke's only an old joke if you've heard it. If you've not heard yeah. it, it's a new joke, isn't exactly. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you be my manager? <laughs> Jeff Green, it's great to talk to you and congratulations on the tour. Have you got a website or something I can plug? Absolutely, yes. I'm uh, um, I, MySpace, myspace.com forward slash comedian Jeff Green. You can't afford jeffgreen.com or I've got jeffgreen.co.uk but it's in um it's in re uh what do they call it rebuilt it's oh. been rebuilt. I've got the scaffolding in and <laughs> I've got the plumbers coming in on Tuesday. And in the meanwhile uh, my space is working perfectly oh. adequately. You're having new curtains and everything. Uh yes, cushions, the wife's doing it. Um <laughs> uh, uh, It'd be a, one of those uh, little sort of uh, urine catcher things around the, to- around the toilet. <laughs> Pointless. I've no idea of what you just said, but I thank you for it. Jeff, thank you very much for coming Cheers. on the programme. Thanks, Alex.